This is uh, John Canalopoulos. It's a pleasure to speak of one of my favorite subjects, kind of one of the pillars in my career, uh, corny cross-linking. We'll speak about indications, applications, results, potential applications and their management, and the evolving technology of CXL. I'm a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the NYU Grossman um, uh, School of Medicine in New York City, New York, Department of Ophthalmology, and the Medical Director at the Laser Vision uh, Ambulatory Surgery Center in Athens, Greece. And these are my financial disclosures, which will be better demonstrated in the letter slide. And cornea cross-linking has been a pivotal part of our uh, customized ablation courses. Of course, custom ablations is a different uh, uh, subject altogether, but um, you can uh, scan this QR code uh, with your phone and uh, enlist to view some of our online courses on customized ablations that, of course, do include a lot of information on uh, cornea cross-linking that we'll discuss further on. And uh, this is uh, basically my background. I'm a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the NYU Grossman Medical School, Department of Ophthalmology, New York City, New York, medical director of the Ambulatory Surgical Center in Athens named Laser Vision. I've been the past president of the International Society of Refractive Surgery, the refractive surgery arm of the American Academy of Ophthalmology for 2016 and 2017. And my clinical training um, is basically in cornea and refractive with a clinical fellowship at uh, Cornell University, North Shore University Hospital, uh, a uh, cornea fellowship uh, training uh, while I was at the Mass Engineer Infirmary with Klaus Dolman, uh, working on the keratoprosthesis project as well there, and a glaucoma clinical fellowship, surgical fellowship at the uh, Mass Engineer Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, my residency, internship, and ophthalmology residency at the State University of New York, Stony Brook, and NASA County Medical Center, Northbrook VA as well. I um, completed a Lancaster course in ophthalmology and I'm a graduate of the Southern Illinois School of Medicine in Springfield, Illinois, as well as um, having spent um, uh, four years at the uh, University of Athens called the National and Capodistrian University, which I entered uh, through national examinations, but I dropped out after fourth year to transfer directly into medical school advanced standing in the United States. My high school uh, years were spent in the uh, Varvakian model institution uh, legacy of the uh, benefactor Ioannis Varvakis um, and uh, very proud of having spent six years there after elementary school in Athens, Greece, where I actually immigrated after born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. So you may, you may understand uh, my personal passion for CXL by just looking on this list after we took the baton from uh, Theo Seiler, who essentially introduced the technique uh, in Dresden with his group of uh, Eberhard Spoil, uh, to whom I owe this uh, picture on the top right. Uh, one of the key uh, pictures on, of Corning Cross Thinking, I thank him for borrowing this to me, um, and um, Dr. Wallensack as well. We were the second team globally to use CXL with a prototype device, the prior vision device at the time in Athens, Greece. We had a special uh, licensure to use it sympathetically in young adults that were going to undergo cornea transplantation many years prior to its uh, C-mark and its clinical use in Europe, which came in 2006. So we early on working with the device since 2002 found that in contrast to the uh, Dresden protocol, working with a different solution of riboflavin, not dextran diluted, but uh, saline diluted, as well as spiking up the fluents and accelerating the process were key. So we introduced this in 2006. At the same time where the Dresden protocol became um, approved in the U European Union with Teo's UVX uh, uh, and Michael Morgan's UVX uh, uh, device, I have no proprietary interest in any of the discoveries we have made 
We uh, published using CXL in uh, the vehicle cornea keratoprosthesis. We introduced into a cornea uh, CXL through a femto pocket in the ESRS meeting 2007. Uh, LASIK extra, our technique of performing under the LASIK flap following the procedure, a boost with um, higher fluent CXL. Once we had the KXL1 device, middle picture here on our slide, in our hands, uh, and then um, showed also that it stabilizes long-term hyperopic LASIK. Um, we won best uh, paper of session back in 2011 at the ACRS of that year. Um, and then combining it with uh, an asthmatic keratotomy to boost that effect. And when 2013, the KXL2 device bottom right picture was introduced by Avidra at the time, now owned by uh, Glockos of the US, uh, we were the first team to work with this technology once it became CMARC, and we showed and published several papers on how customized CXL can have a refractive effect. We used it in our um, signature Athens protocol uh, technique we introduced back in 2004 of combining the puffy guided normalization of the cornea and higher fluency CXL to further boost the refractive effect of the Athens protocol and reduce the amount of tissue removed. We introduced ray tracing customization in the Athens Protocol, published in 2021. And I consider the biggest honor academically to have been invited by the Journal of Cornea to write an editorial on the, com the combination of the uh, surface ablation to normalize the cornea and CXL, our Athens Protocol. And of course, I opted to include all the major investigators that have used our protocol or identification of it uh, mirroring our clinical uh, data and I invite you to read this quite interesting paper we'll talk about it uh, further on. So here's our uh, presentation we called it back then collagen cross-linking where now its official name is cornea cross-linking um, using high influence uh, of 7 milliwatts for uh, 15 minutes, uh, way before it was commercially available, and uh, we'll see in the next slide. This is our publication on using an in-pocket through cornea CXL process. The pocket created back then with the Intralace FS60 um, and. Um, the publication of the uh, at the journal of refractive surgery and this is a current kind of guy and essentially introducing uh, in situ uh, cxl in the human cornea uh, which is really the true epithelium on uh, cxl procedure through our work we have endeavored in the laboratory to see how much boosting fluence um, can still have an effect. And here is our landmark study published in the Journal of Cornea where we used uh, biomechanical stretching and enzymatic digestion as the two biomechanical criteria for how a um, allograft cornea ex vivo is strengthened in the lab with CXL. And of course, on the top left with orange is a landmark resident protocol followed by 9 uh, milliwatts per centimeter square for 10 minutes, uh, right next to it in green. We're seeing they're relatively similar. Then when we bump up the fluence to 18 milliwatts per centimeter square for 5 minutes, the blue is quite similar to green. And uh, the purple uh, box uh, or histogram shows 30 milliwatts per centimeter square for 3 minutes, showing, of course, less of an effect uh, than the Dresden protocol in orange, but still uh, significant. Once we uh, go to 45 milliwatts per centimeter square, the difference is none from sham, showing that at some point, if we boost um, the um, uh, energy for CXL, we lose the effect because obviously we run out of oxygen and many other investigators have uh, worked on this. This is our uh, publication um, underlying the importance of how high we can go with fluence. And of course, this is the pathway of how we ended up with the Athens Protocol, seen in the bottom right here, 
we started uh, as one of the first teams globally to use topography guided ablations a therapeutic tool introduced back then in 2003 by Wavelight. It was an independent company in Erlag in Germany. And we're seeing on the left enlarging the optical zone on the bottom middle, treating a scar, which kind of looks like an upside down keratoconus before, after, and difference map. And uh, the bottom left picture shows the keratoconic eye before and after, and how drastically most of the uh, topometric uh, symmetry indices um, reviewed with Appendicam shown here improve following uh, our treatment. But all this work was after we had published in the Journal of Corning 2007, top right, a case in which we first applied CXL. We had a reasonable one or two diaper flattening, but the patient was still contact lens intolerant and a cornea transplantation candidate. So we ended up uh, doing the uh, forbidden at the time, uh, treating this cornea with a topographic guided surface ablation. We set the first standards for this as this territory was essentially uncharted, and we're very pleased that most investigators have followed these uh, guidelines of maximum up to 50 microns of stromal tissue to be removed, because these ablations tend to be very tissue demanding and tissue hungry, if I uh, can use that term. Um, and this is where the concept of uh, uh, the athletes protocol basically initiated when we combined the two. Again, uh, uh, the detail of our paper in the Journal of Cornea, which took us two or three years to publish, um, but eventually it did. And this was the first landmark paper of combining CXL in a sequential matter with six months later, um, a topography guided uh, normalization of the cornea in a, a uh, procedure that we showed that when performed simultaneously has far more advantages. Here our paper in using um, higher fluency Excel in uh, LASIK and in uh, hyperopic patients in particular in showing that we have, when we did a contralateral eye study, a far long-term higher stability in the hyperopic effect um, uh, achieved with hyperopic LASIK um, and uh, basically the introduction of LASIK extra as a technique. And jumping through time, but all these key pearls in corn and cross-linking our paper from the 2023 uh, Vienna ESCRS, where we're looking now, and we've treated over 3,000 patients when this paper was put together and presented at the uh, ESCRS in Vienna. Um, we're looking at how the epithelium remodels after um, corn and cross-linking and uh, with the Athens protocol in particular. And we are showing, as you can see on the bottom picture, that the initial thinning of the epithelium to accommodate a biomechanically unstable cornea reverses, and the epithelium becomes thicker even at the cornea apex, the keratoconus meaning apex, which has been flattened by the Athens protocol, as we can see in the pentacam images in the middle right. Um, and. Uh, also on these cross-section images, our introduction of the six line on OCT, which was done in our landmark 2009 paper at the JRS and comparing sequential to um, uh, same combined CXL and topography guided uh, cross-thinking, meaning the Athens protocol. So let's go into some of the key questions. When and how to perform cornea cross-linking? And of course, in order to be answered this question, in order to be able to answer this question, rather, we need to first learn how to screen for a keratoconus. We need to realize that there's a very significant familiar predisposition for keratoconus in contrast to what has been published in the past. How do we document progression? This is a key question in order to evaluate, number one, if our keratoconus is active, number two, if it eye that we have cross-linked remains stable in time, does the imaging that we have show us potential progression and thus failure of our treatment? What is the optimal pediatric population technique 
and what is the optimal for adults in using cross-linking. And of course, always uh, review, as we have done and published, the potential complications and especially those with uh, pediatric patients. In going uh, in depth with uh, screening for keratoconus, nothing I think in our experience describes it better than the over 200 keratoconic eyes reviewed meticulously with several parameters, one of them being visual acuity. And you're seeing the spread on the um, right where the histograms of each one of the parameters evaluated. Uh, visual acuity is the top left and you see how similar normals to stage one, stage two, stage three, and st stage four keratoconus with the amsoil chroma criteria are showing as the visual acuity unfortunately is a terrible uh, screening method for keratoconus. And of course, it's the only one that is worldwide accepted and practiced because patients go to the doctor when they don't see well. So this paper alone should really intrigue us, should be a compelling evidence that we need to screen randomly for keratoconus, especially in adolescents, in uh, countries that keratoconus is endemic, such as Greece. And from these, this paper, we've learned and we've shared with the ophthalmic community that the IHD seen on the uh, left picture, one of the topometric surface asymmetry uh, indices with the pentacam is the most sensitive tool as the different stages of keratoconus and normals are spread out a lot in these histograms to pick up keratoconus, with the only exception of the central cones. Second, most important, the ISV. IHD is the index of uh, height decentration. ISV is the index of surface variance. Third, most important, the IHA, the index of uh, height asymmetry, and so on and so forth. These parameters are abbreviated on the left uh, pentacam topometric parameter image, and we've shown how this is key along with epithelial uh, mapping uh, that we'll discuss in a little bit. So in this slide, kind of a review of our key elements in um, screening for keratoconus. We talked in the previous slide on um, the very large cohort of patients that we evaluated with several parameters showing that the IHD is the most sensitive parameter and picking it up in cornea tomography. And of course, we're talking about early keratoconus and not obviously clinically evident keratoconus, which is picked up even from the software of our diagnostic devices. In the middle top picture, we're seeing total cornea thickness and epithelial maps from the uh, uh, RT view um, anterior segment OCT by OptiView at the time, which we wrote the literature, as you can see on the slide underneath, that reveals that cornea epithelium is probably one of the most stable human parameters, uh, human body parameters added as we found in naive eyes that it was um, universal and at all points of the cornea, at any age, um, regardless of sex, race, uh, refractive error, et cetera, et cetera. And we also showed using high frequency ultrasound that in keratoconus, it's not only that we have remodeling of cornea epithelium, but overall the epithelium thickens even in areas where we don't have ectasia in the cornea. And this may be an early predictive design, meaning, um, the predictive sign rather, meaning if we have over epithelial thickening of the cornea epithelium, we may be looking at a biomechanically unstable cornea. Very important as we in our landmark paper showed that after CXL, the overall epithelial thickness is under normal, underlining the um, truth uh, of our hypotheses. Uh, and we call that reactive epithelial hyperplasia, probably in lieu of a higher oscillation of the cornea when the cornea is biomechanically unstable. Some of the work we have done through the years, which we feel is pivotal in keratoconus diagnosis, which of course is the door into whether we're going to cross-link or not. So in summary, cross-link early, but be aware, we have to screen for keratoconus efficiently, and we gave you some of the tools 
in the previous slides we have to screen family first degree family if we can there's a very strong we feel it's 100% uh, but nevertheless very strong familiar predisposition for keratoconus in my mind keratoconus is something we inherit a predisposition and we develop if we rub our eyes and you always have to ask patients if they sleep you can guess how they sleep by looking at a keratoconic patient uh, one eye worse than the other then you know the patient sleeps on that eye uh, it lays his or her eye on their hands that particular eye that has more advanced keratoconus underlying the importance of eye rubbing and development of keratoconus especially in puberty um, we'll speak about optimal techniques for pediatric patients and how to manage uh, potential complications Now a brief review of the Athens Protocol CXL here and uh, by reading this slide you can familiarize yourself with some of the key um, steps we've learned along the way um, and we'll talk a little bit more on the concept of our Athens Protocol uh, cross-linking technique uh, in the following uh, slides. more information for you here to read on the aim of designing uh, the topography guided treatment which is bimodal and um, uh, how important the hyperopic component of this topography guided therapeutic basically surface ablation is. So we'll go a lot back and forth in order to uh, entice your interest and we're looking at a successful, uh, I would say, um, Athens Protocol patient before on the left, after on the right and we're comparing the topometric symmetry or symmetry indices and see the difference in the IHD it goes from 0 0.146 to 0 0.029 from, so from 146 to 29 Keratoconus stage goes from 3 to 4 to 2, and the ISV from 137 to 70. Uh, the IHA from 34.5 to normal, 7.3, along with the other parameters here. And again, how valuable the topometric indices in cornea imaging with the Pendicam are key in documenting progression or the b beneficial effects of um, Corneal cross-linking with the Athens protocol, despite the fact that the patient may not have an improvement in their uncorrected visual acuity. So it's very important to properly consent our patients and their family, because most of these are younger patients. Some of them are not even adults at the time that they need to undergo the procedure. That uh, this is not a uh, laser vision correction. We're not going to get uh, uh, spectacle independence with this technique. This is a technique that we're aiming to use in order to avoid corneal transplantations. As you will see uh, on this slide, this is what we're trying to avoid, the, the bottom right picture of a great, but in most cases today, unnecessary corneal transplant. So let's go on the uh, when to, co to cross lane. This is a patient, 51 year old, so I've heard it many times, I don't agree. You're over 40, you're done with keratoconus. It will never progress. This gentleman is 40, 51 years old rather. He has a decrease in his uh, corrected visual acuity. He was told, well, you have a cataract. We look at his Pentacam maps top left, they look normal. The device reads them normal. We look at the um, Placido dystopography, is it normal? Well, we're looking at a little bit of scissoring on the top right picture um, and also truncation, meaning the bow tie of the astigmatism by the topographer here is shorter than the nine millimeter diameter that the color map shows on the top right. And on the bottom, the Cassini reflection topography also shows the same. Some scissoring and truncation of the astigmatism. Well, maybe, 
Let's see the next slide and let's discuss this uh, issue again. What's going on with this patient? Why is he losing corrected visual acuity? Of course, and I know that some of you have thought about it, the answer comes from using a gas permeable contact lens. If the patient with a lens uh, on sees great, you know it's a cornea issue and you know it has been a cornea change that has dropped his corrected visual acuity. But the answer, of course, comes with the um, uh, anterior segment OCT and the epithelial maps. And yes, this is the same patient. And yes, you can see on the epithelial maps on the bottom how in both eyes there's tremendous epithelial remodeling hiding from the topographer, obscuring the topographer from diagnosing the um, change in the shape of the cornea stroma because the epithelial remodeling acts as a resurfacing agent to give better vision and to, and in essence, hides the keratoconic change, coverage of change um, in this patient. So according to what we talked about before, on which eye does the patient sleep on? The left eye, because you can see there's significant remodeling on the left. The epithelium on the cone looks blue. Um, where in the other eye, there's active keratoconus because we still have a little bit of blue on the right eye in the peak of the cone where the cornea on the top pictures is the thinnest. Uh, of course, th this is high-tech technology of our century. If you go back to the basics on the right, you can see with cobalt blue, there is a Fleischer ring and it's actually present there uh, in uh, just the simple slit lamp picture. But in any case, we went through this small journey in order to um, go through the basic diagnostics for keratoconus in, in a more illustrative way. And this patient, of course, needs to stop rubbing their eyes. I know that one of his two parents has a suspicion for keratoconus. We need to scan his children if he has children, especially if they're um, uh, male in teenage um, uh, age group. Um, and uh, needs cornea cross-linking. And then we will also consider the Athens protocol if we want to uh, treat the, the cornea irregularity and improve visual function. As far as the cataract, in my opinion, not of significance. Uh, now, I wonder what you think about it looking at the bottom right picture. So we talked a little bit about whether there is familiar predisposition keratoconus. Literature says about 10%. This is a keratoconic patient on the left. And in the middle, the mother's uh, right and left uh, pentacam maps. Um, and on the far right, the father's. Now by comparing the mother's and the father's, the father looks relatively normal. Uh, although he has steeper corneas than the mother. But the cornea thickness maps, which on the pentacam is the bottom left, is for me the most pivotal one. One may say that uh, on the left eye, the, the bottom bottom right picture, the thickness map is a little bit deviated temporally, but it's not because in the oval circle, I'm underlining the angle cap or parameters for the X and Y that's always present on the pentacam. So uh, this is a normal cornea, perfect thickness viewed by the pentacam on the cornea vertex because there's significant angle kappa, thus the, epithelial, the uh, actual uh, cornea thickness maps lo look a little bit skewed. The suspect is the mother because we can see clearly on the thickness maps the lower um, left pictures on both of her pentacams. Uh, there is many steps, it's not just two colors, the left eye is worse, has about six steps of change in cornea uh, thickness, and the thinnest part of the cornea, especially on the, on the left eye, is not in the center, is skewed temporally without angle kappa. So the suspect is the mother. Is it important if the mother is over 40? Maybe, if she rubs her eye. What should we know? We need the epithelial maps. But if the epithelial maps are all green and there's no suspicion, this gives us a key to look into the mother's side of the family 
She may have nephews or nieces that are teenagers and we may be able to pick up very early keratoconus earlier than her son that we're seeing here on the left. So this is how within your practice you can become small, I don't think small, but uh, I would say uh, elegant and clever detectives in order to pick up keratoconus in a broader spectrum of each family that you're um, diagnosing through one member. So let's say we've diagnosed keratoconus and this is a patient that we're not concerned about cross-linking because the patient is over 40, the visual acuity is excellent. How do we document progression? And again, this is a crucial question before offering uh, cornea cross-linking because we know cornea cross-linking is not a panacea. It does have complication. It may um, make the patient's life worse than it was before cross-linking. So ideally, I showed you before the tools. We want to follow um, sign fluke imaging, look at the um, topometric asymmetry indices, especially the IHD, and of course, look at cornea thickness mapping uh, if you have access to the OptiView, which is now owned by uh, Visionix uh, with the Avanti and the Solix technology, you're definitely a step ahead in diagnosing keratoconus. For us, epithelial mapping is a crucial step. We scan every single patient that we see in our practice in Athens, Greece, and New York City, New York. So uh, the basic techniques, epithelium off, although we showed that uh, epithelium on 6 cell could be are, uh, introduced uh, in the cornea through a femtosecond laser pocket CXL to introduce ribo in that pocket in CXL through a cornea that does not have riboflavin on it, so it allows the UV light to reach the uh, stroma soaked with riboflavin. But the standard techniques are epithelium off, the standard dredging protocol. For us, the standard protocol is the epithelium off with the Athens protocol, which means we uh, invariably do a topography guided normalization or a ray tracing normalization, as we will see later on. Uh, we will employ Epion in some younger pediatric patients where we feel the morbidity of uh, uh, Athens protocol epithelium off uh, technique may be intolerant for the patient. Um, as we know, uh, we were able to cross-link just one boy at 10 years, but uh, patients younger than 14, we've, we've had great difficulty, um, and we've had to go to the OR, the hospital, and uh, put them under uh, general anesthesia in order to complete the procedure. Of course, uh, other techniques that some colleagues have advocated are intracornea ring segments and CXL, we're seeing new work with um, uh, allograft uh, intracornea ring segments called CARES, CAI, um, RS uh, with CXL, and that's probably a smart technique that we'll see and read more in the future. So since we're talking about techniques, going back through the steps of our Athens protocol, Step number one, uh, do the uh, topography guided partial, of course, in refraction because we're treating very little from the refraction. But see how irregular the top left picture is and how much regularity you'll be able to offer the irregular keratoconic cornea along with removing Bowman's membrane and some of the surface stroma to allow for riboflavin to penetrate readily in the cornea and the UV light to unobstructed cross-link the residual cornea stroma. We use the epithelial part of uh, removal as a second step, although it may sound bizarre to some, why remove the epithelium if you will treat on the epithelium with the topography guided, but this is because this second step requires less um, correction by the tracker and no psych rotation adjustment. So if you add the two, they're the same, so that's, this is why we treat topo guided first epithelial removal part second, jumping then to the bottom right, uh, mitomycin C, 0.02% for 30 to um, 60 seconds, uh, and then uh, going to our last stage, um, our sweet uh, spot and technique for CXL in the Athens protocol has been 6 milliwatts per centimeter 
centimeter square of fluids. Of course, we use the rubber flavins saline diluted um, solution of 0.1%. Um, and uh, this fluids for 50 minutes to attain the best possible result. And we'll show you how um, in uh, some images later on. So this is a typical Athens protocol patient before left, after, middle, and difference on the right. We can see a drastic difference of flattening of the cone of 10.3 doctors, but please pay attention to how the superior to the center cornea has been become uh, steeper because it had flattened as a counteraction for the ectasia. So from 35.5, it went all the way up to 40.2, with a max difference of 6.9 diopters. So we actually corrected this huge step if we look on the left image of peak 50.2, flat 35.5. So about 15 diopters of a step in the central cornea corrected by over 17 um, diopters of um, correction here on our difference map on the right. So underlying the value and the synergy of using both the partial and refraction surface ablation of maximum 50 microns on the peak of the cone and higher fluency excel, meaning our Athens protocol. So let's go look at some key questions. How long does it last? We reported at the American Academy and it has been since published in literature um, a very large cohort of our 10-year results with the Athens Protocol. We have reported in the literature a total of about 1,000 eyes, very carefully and meticulously uh, evaluated. But um, our 10-year group here showed that basically, and this is evident on the bottom left graph, that after the first um, uh, three months and the first year, there's very little change through uh, time. If we look at the bottom uh, right picture, we can see that there's some progressive slight flattening after the first year, but the majority of the differences happen within the first three months. They actually happen right away, but it's the cornea epithelium remodeling that takes about three months to balance and be able to give us proper and accurate cornea imaging. And of course, we're looking at uh, the preoperative one year, 10 year and p-value of significant results on the top left um, table, which shows the robustness of the technique, mainly on how significant it is to flatten these corneas, normalize these corneas, and offer um, a, a drastic increase in uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity. These are compelling data. Uh, of course, with the cost of removing uh, uh, cornea tissue, most of these eyes uh, show a 50 micron reduction in stromal thickness, but they are uh, biomechanically far more stable than a normal eye, just justifying the employment of this technique. Of course, uh, we reported, um, these are the summary of the data on the top uh, left, we reported in some cases uh, through time a progressive flattening effect, of, as we can see in the case here, um, a year after, several years after, and about 10 years later, showing a significant flattening in the hyperopic shift that we were able to correct with a hyperopic second PRK procedure, something that we reported in the meetings of the year of 2023, both ACRS, AAO, and ESCRS. This is a very rare occurrence. Um, we showed that uh, it happens um, in, in under 1% of the patients, but clinicians need to be aware of this, and we feel we ought to um, share that with them. Again, one more case here showing uh, how some of these cases through time show a drastic continuous flattening, probably because there is a bimodal level of CXL within this particular patient's cornea. And because still to the date, we use one dose of CXL for every single patient. We don't titrate the dose for each treatment. We hope that we reach a point where 
our uh, ability to uh, diagnose and measure the biomechanical stability of each cornea, especially the keratoconic corneas that progress, uh, will enable us to titrate the uh, respective amount of CXL needed to stabilize that cornea. And of course, uh, this uh, case show, uh, shows a super strong effect of CXL that though may um, end up with hyperopic surprise for the patient that will be treated either with uh, a lens-based or a cornea-based surgery. And we can do that because the hyperopic shift uh, is corrected through a hyperopic correction that treats mainly periphery. And this is our um, report on pediatric CXL, also presented at the American Academy and currently published literature showing very similar data with the adult population. Of course, it's a smaller um, number of patients studied. Nevertheless, probably the biggest one reported in the literature, 52 consecutive cases, where uh, through time, we'll see in the next slide, the um, parameters mirror those of the adult population. And here, the key graphs keratometric regression of through two years and uh, the uh, regression of the index of high decentration, our go-to metric of the cornea to establish normalization of the cornea, and it's tied with increased visual function, meaning increase in uncorrected and drastic increase in corrected visual acuity. So much needed in these young patients that we, of course, want to avoid performing cornea transplant. And for your perusal, um, here's a um, poster at the American Academy going through all the data of our pediatric population uh, uh, presentation that has been also published in the peer-reviewed literature. And of course, it's time to talk about potential complications, and some of them are specific for pediatric patients. Contact lens use is a specific concern. Uh, we may get uh, annular infiltrates, and we need to be aware to differentiate those from infectious keratitis. Um, it appears to us that pediatric patients are more prone for post-CXL stromal scarring, so UV protection, not just the first three months of the procedure, but probably for a couple of years may be important especially in, in uh, countries like Greece that have so much uh, sun exposure. And of course, reduce eye rubbing. Uh, we um, will share with you our do-it-yourself face mask uh, video on YouTube that uh, may help you help your patients uh, make their own comfortable face mask that they can sleep and avoid rubbing their eyes inadvertently in their sleep. That we discussed already is probably the key uh, element, the key parameter for keratoconus progression. So when do CXL? CXL early. For keratoconus, especially in pediatric patients, we can see here a Munson sign on the left eye, on the right eye rather, left picture of this uh, patient, the bottom picture is comparing. And if you're Seeing a right eye uh, as here on the bottom left picture, the patient has advanced far too much. The patient should have been offered cornea cross-linking way before this stage. Remember, strong familial predisposition, so if you have a, somebody in the family, scan the family, document the progression efficiently as we showed. We talked about optimal pediatric uh, applications. And of course, be aware that in trisomy 21, there's a very high risk for keratoconus and intense eye rubbing, and especially the worst kind of keratoconus, the central one, that goes into high drops and needs cornea transplantation. The last thing that a young um, patient with trisomy 21 um, will have as a burden in their life. Of course, there's alternative treatments to the Athens protocol. Perform CXL alone, you will lose the ability of uh, simultaneously improving visual function. 
Contact lenses, yes, Brembo contact lenses, clear lenses are a great solution if you live in a country where patients can tolerate them due to climate and environmental factors. Intracornea ring segments seen here on the far right uh, had been a uh, mainstay of treatment for many years. We have abandoned their use due to significant problems long-term with melt, loss of their efficacy. Uh, we're renewing our interest uh, after uh, we showed um, with a porcine xenograft uh, cross-link that uh, there's feasibility to use uh, uh, tissue that's not made of synthetic material in the cornea and have an effect. Um, colleagues uh, used allograft uh, cornea tissue, the CARES technique that we talked about, about before, and that may be um, a significant alternative to the Athens protocol. Uh, lamellar careplasty and penetrative training careplasty are, of course, other alternatives to uh, cornea cross-linking, and of course, we're trying to avoid those. Some more complications we talked about here, um, delayed epithelial healing, um, a immune ring we can see in the um, uh, middle bottom picture. It's also not like hyaline deposits under the epithelium that need to uh, have the uh, clinical team's attention because if they left untreated, they can create significant scarring. So I've inadvertently um, come to the conclusion that they need to be treated on the slit lamp. I use a uh, antibiotic uh, soaked uh, Q-tip, roll it over and, and brush off the hyaline deposit. Of course, I may develop a small epithelial defect uh, which will heal uh, sometimes uh, by uh, tapering off the steroids for a couple of days faster, uh, but necessary step along with the images that we're seeing on the uh, top right picture of these bizarre white deposits on the epithelium uh, in the center, which are basically necrotic epithelium, not allowing proper repithelization. So the solution there in our experience is remove enough epithelium to refresh the wound and have it heal better and avoid these areas uh, developing long-term scarring. Here we're seeing um, our uh, recommendations through experience of management of these um, rare but very important complications. We see on the top middle an early immune ring that's probably related to contact lens wear and not necessarily an infection. It could be 360 degrees. You should be aware of this. Uh, obviously, taking off uh, the bandage lens and boosting the topical corticosteroids will help with that. We talked about the top, <coughs> excuse me, right on the Salzman like um, surface island deposits and how we recommend seeing on the bottom left um, a uh, antibiotic soaked uh, cotton swab and rolling it over to remove this hyaline um, necrotic epithelial deposits that if left alone and ignored by the clinical team, they can uh, uh, develop into significant scarring. And uh, very important picture on the bottom middle, you see that little white ring and uh, edematous and cloudy epithelium around it in a central tiny defect. Now this is a ring of necrotic epithelium that does not allow the re of the center of the uh, cornea and this can evolve as a scar as well. So here we have to take a deep breath and be um, affirmative. Remove this ring. Um, you can buff it off with a cotton swab. You can remove it on the slit lamp, create a bigger epithelial defect, but help resolve this impasse uh, at this certain point. Um, as we can see on the picture on the um, uh, bottom right where we have done so, uh, and this uh, with a bandage lens uh, healed in just one day. So some later uh, issues that we've seen, you can see in the top middle picture, a um, cornea haze that almost mimics the ablation pattern. And I've learned from my friend, uh, Xu Hao Chen, um, a, a brilliant um, Chinese colleague that has been applying the ethics protocol in his country and, and probably uh, by dozens, multitude of patients that we have, that by uh, enlarging the transition zone, 
we're getting less of this effect. This uh, is a result of the abrupt shift in ablation between ablated and unablated cornea, and we have done that since, and yes, indeed, we have had less of that scarring. This is the reason why we use mitomycin C in our current Athens protocol in the patients that we treat here in um, Athens, Greece, um, and also in New York City, New York, in my practice there. Bottom left, we can see late haze developing. Uh, this is a pediatric patient. Two years after the Athens protocol, had spent the whole summer in the sun using as, uh, working as a beach boy and developed uh, this diffuse haze. Resembles the haze that has been described in people who have climbed multi-high altitudes following PRK, uh, Everest and Kilimanjaro, uh, mountain climbers, um, and then uh, six months later, the picture next to it after topical corticosteroid treatment. So in the pediatric population, we caution clinicians to use UV protection for years maybe following the uh, combined procedure. The bottom middle picture show the, um, uh, these uh, dendrite-like white um, uh, elevations of necrotic epithelium that uh, need to be removed. They're, they're in essence, a uh, expression of, uh, of difficulty of the epithelium to repopulate the surface, and this is due to the magnitude of the two procedures, the surface ablation and the uh, cornea cross-linking that we know causes apoptosis of the keratocytes to about a 300 micron depth in the cornea. Thus, a lot of these uh, apoptotic byproducts reach the surface uh, or, and or create significant inflammation to uh, also mirror a difficulty in, in the surface and epithelial remodeling. And this is a sign where tapering steroids boosting um, factors that uh, improve the surface, such as oral tetracycline like medications. We particularly like Oracea, it's a new oral 40 milligram um, doxycycline that gets absorbed very late in the GI tract, so almost zero adverse effects from its use. It's a small dose, but good enough to treat acne rosacea and blepharitis that helps uh, improve the tear film, sacrosporin um, A, drops, autologous serum, a bandage contact lens, and always that, that play of on-off the steroids, which we know are necessary to keep cornea clarity, but we also know inhibit proper re-epithelization. There's also other agents that enhance uh, epithelization that may come into play depending what part of the world you practice. And last bottom right, we're seeing an infiltrate and um, some hypopion. We do have here an infectious keratitis that is always something that needs to be in our mind and the reason we follow up these patients closely. And here again, a patient uh, from our 10-year uh, uh, publication that uh, his journey started in 2008 and in 2009 shows a drastic improvement with the Athens protocol. In 2012, uh, there's a hyperbole in the flattening of the cone. There's no intervention in between 2008 and on. And then in 2016, you can see there's further flattening of the cone area to reach a total of over 17 diopters. And of course, this is not uh, predictable. It happens in some patients. We reported that this happens in under 1% of the patients, but needs to be in our mind that as I noted before, we cross-link one dose for all in some patients. This may inadvertently create differentials in areas of the cornea and how they have been cross-linked. So we have an, if we have an area that's over cross-linked next to an area that is under cross-linked, or if we have scarring in an area, this means super, super cross-linking, um, then we can get uh, more significant uh, flattening and of course this may become a um, visual rehabilitation issue contact lenses an icl clear lens extraction or a surface ablation here because this causes a hyperopic shift so an ablation can be placed at the seven millimeter diameter where there is cornea reserve we talked about that before we've presented in the last uh, in the meetings of 2022 and 23 uh, our uh, experience with fixing these uh, very rare but very significant uh, overcorrected with cross thinking eyes.
And of course, cornea cross thinking, there's many theories, in my opinion, and I know this may sound exaggerated, cornea cross thinking in my mind is a controlled um, way to selectively scar the cornea and increase its biomechanical integrity and uh, change its biomechanical behavior. Now, some of the long unknown potential risks are obviously we're using um, UV energy uh, and uh, oxygen radicals induced by the flavin, riboflavin in this particular that becomes activated, it creates an ion and then releases oxygen radicals. Uh, limbo stem cell deficiency is a potential possibility. We have not seen this and we now have almost 20 years experience. Conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma and the toxicity is the one we uh, are concerned the most and the reason why we use riboflavin and we try not to cross think very thin corneas. Um, it, it has been a, a rarity for us. I have not seen one single patient in over 5,000 patients treated over the last 20 years, but it should be always on my mind. And remember, riboflavin is the vehicle that conducts the photochemical reaction of cross thinking but it's also the shield for the endothelium, so UV light doesn't reach the endothelial surface. So good penetration of the stroma, and the stroma just superior or anterior to the endothelium is the key in protecting that. Um, the risk of uh, developing cataract is also in play here since we're using significant uh, UV light, and uh, the interference with intraocular pressure measurements, this is a very important point because the rule that in a thinner cornea, we add numbers on the IOP measured on the cornea surface if this cornea has been cross-linked, does not apply because now biomechanically, the cornea is not behaving like a thinner cornea, but it may be behaving like a thicker cornea. So this does create a puzzling condition for eyes that have been cross-linked and we need to um, take that into account um, and rely more on optic nerve imaging and assessment of the optic nerve than IOP measurements, in particular in glaucoma patients or glaucoma suspects, a very, very important aspect of post-cornea cross-linking patients. So we go, we're going a little bit back and forth on early diagnosis and treatment modalities, and we're going back now to what is it that changes first in ectasia? And these are the key questions, and from these questions you can kind of allude to the way we're searching cornea cross-linking in our diagnostics. Does thickness change first, or does the curvature change first in keratoconus? Now, obviously, we saw before examples that the curvature did not change because the epithelia remodeled and masked the stromal curvature change. Does the anterior curvature change first or the posterior curvature changes first? Remember that our imaging of the posterior cornea curvature relies on evaluations such as sine fluke imaging that require a pristine cornea. So in a cornea that has started to evolve in ectasia and we have epithelial remodeling, or in a cornea that has any lack of clarity, the posterior cornea curvature data are biased and cannot be used uh, with accuracy. But it does make sense that the posterior cornea curvature will show signs earlier because the anterior has epithelial remodeling to compensate for change in curvature. But in essence, uh, it is clear to me now after all these years and studying thousands and tens of thousands of corneas that the first problem in ectasia, keratoconus and post-refractive surgery ectasia, is that we have change in the biomechanical behavior of the cornea. And remember, the cornea is the only part of the human body that is born ready. It does not change throughout our life as shape it may change a little bit in biomechanical stability with it being increased from decade to decade. So biomechanics probably weaken first. So this is why our reactive epithelial theory is very key here because if we see a cornea that we consider stable that has thicker epithelium than normal, it's not specific, but we sh should suspect weakened biomechanics. This is where our bi biomechanical measurements are key and we have some work with the Corvus and the Aura and the Bruyan 
uh, technique. We have a new instrument out in 2023 commercially and have work from the um, MIT and Harvard Medical School. I know Roberto Pineda, uh, a co-fellow with me at the time in uh, Mass Ioneer, is leading the investigators into this brilliant work and be able to image the cornea and get true biomechanical numbers and thus judge which corneas need cross-thinking or not. But this slide alone is a whole day meeting for experts to discuss and I just place it here for uh, reflection. And I invite you to visit our YouTube channel um, from the Laser Vision Laboratory Surgery Center Institute. Uh, we have a recorded presentation on just um, anterior segment imaging. Uh, this was a course I gave during the coronavirus uh, era to our residents at uh, NYU. And although for some of you it may sound very basic, it's a good refreshment course on uh, looking back into um, these uh, principles that are uh, evolving. So a year or two years down the line, we may have new data on this front on uh, modalities of cornea imaging. And this is again, um, uh, these are images from our YouTube channel, um, the Laser Vision Ambulatory Eye Surgery Unit, and um, all the presentations we have on uh, refractive uh, cornea imaging principles, part of our custom course that I noted previously that you're, uh, if you scan that QR code, you're welcome to subscribe and uh, have that milieu, a kind of a two-day course within your office or your home uh, to be able to better understand uh, some of the things that we have learned uh, through the years. And as I always like to do, uh, from theory to real life, this is a patient that I was presented to in um, uh, my New York City practice. Uh, we're on 61st and Park Avenue. Um, and uh, this was a litigation case on post LASIK ectasia. And by looking at this sine fluke pentacam map, we can see that the top left picture showing the sagittal curvature of the total cornea power, it says front, but uh, this is an oculus issue. This is total cornea power. Um, we can all say this is ectasia, inferior steepening, superior flattening. Uh, but study more the other aspects of this sign fluke imaging. For instance, the uh, uh, elevation of the front surface, top right, the elevation of the back surface, bottom right. Again, remember what we said in the previous slide. In order for this particular picture to be accurate, we need a pristine cornea, uh, pristine clarity, optical clarity of the cornea, and a regular cornea surface. Let's assume it is, this picture is impeccable. So the posterior cornea surface in elevation maps looks perfect. And we'll finish with my favorite, which is the cornea thickness map, the lower left map, which lo looks a little bit uh, altered if this was a normal cornea to begin with because it thins abruptly, uh, a little bit superal, temporally, this is the right eye, but that's really far away from the point of ectasia. So we have a big discrepancy between what we would call the peak of the cone um, on the top left picture and the thinnest part of this cornea on the bottom left picture, which is puzzling. So this is not ectasia. This is a decentered, this is a LASIK case, Without knowing the numbers, I know now that this was a mixed astigmatic LASIK case, which was decentered. The patient was probably squinting during the procedure. Some lasers cannot pick that movement of the pupil. The pupil moved um, upwards, thus the ablation was performed inferior to the originally targeted central of the cornea. And uh, this eccentric ablation created a ectasia-like picture. Nice. Uh, image to study and understand the principles behind diagnosing ectasia and keratoconus and when to intervene. Of course, what are we missing here? We're missing the epithelial pictures, of course. And But I think that the, pe the Pentacam maps alone here can make the diagnosis.
And now we talked about before uh, on how important the topometric asymmetry indices are, and, and this is the topometric data available on your Pentacam. This is the right eye of a female patient uh, that we treated many years ago for, with the ethics protocol on her left worst eye with keratoconus. And the, the right eye vision remains 2020. She is now pregnant, three months pregnant, and we're looking at her images from um, uh, almost uh, a year and three months ago, actually a, a year and four months ago, with vision being 2020 on her good, quote unquote, unaffected eye. Number one, the pentacam now reads keratoconus. Number two, look at the IHD. It went from 0 0.010 normal to 0 0.031. The ISV from 31 to 43, the IHA from 7.3 to 16.8, the KI, the keratometry index from 1.04 to 1.010 being abnormal. This is an evolving keratoconic eye and it needs to be addressed. I know there's literature saying that pregnancy can accelerate keratoconus. We have not seen this. We think that eye rubbing is the key element. Um, and uh, of course, this lady sleeps face down exchanges first one eye, then the other eye. Obviously she rubs more her left eye, which we had treated in the past, but it appears that she rubs her right eye as well. We need also epithelial maps here for confirmation, um, but uh, this is a silent progression of keratoconus. Uh, the actual keratometric data, if you compare them, have not changed much. Her average keratometry was 41.6 before, and it's still 41.6. The Ks changed from 40.5 flat to 40.7, and steep 42.7 to 42.6. So the steepest K is actually flatter on the numbers. But remember, the topometric asymmetry indices is your biggest friend here, and it will flag very early changes in keratoconus. I think in cornea diagnostics, this may be the most important slide I have to share with you uh, today and on this talk. And again here, uh, jumping to our cornea diagnostics, um, this is a uh, laser vision correction candidate. He is uh, no more, she is rather no more happy with her glasses. She's a minus three, minus one and a half. The cornea thickness looks good. We're at 505. The maps were, look relatively good, but pay attention to the top left picture, our placido disc imaging. There's scissoring of the astigmatism and truncation. Um, and we talked about this in a previous slide, also on the Cassini images of that same patient. Now, if we look at a similar patient on the left, we can also see the truncation, but the bottom right picture of the posterior elevation shows some significant differences in the posterior curvature. Of course, we need epithelial maps here, it's the thickness map, excuse me, it's the thickness map here that makes me very suspicious that she is evolving with ectasia. She is an eye rubber. You guessed it, she sleeps on her left eye, eye on her left knuckles, face down. And you see the shape of the cornea has many steps of thickness uh, change instead of the classic to blue and green on the pentacam. And the shape of the thickness changes are skewed infratemporally. This is a classic qualitative sign for keratoconus. We hope we develop AI to be able to flag this and we don't have to go in particular and look at this. So can this lady have a laser vision correction? Yes, but definitely not LASIK or SMILE. PRK is the way to go and we do have to isolate eye rubbing from this patient's life. And of course, it's no surprise, we talked about it before, if we look at the uh, cornea epithelial maps, the bottom maps with the OptiView now uh, Visionics uh, Avanti and the new Solix device gives us a little broader epithelial maps from nine millimeters, we go out to 10. You can see the epithelial modeling, um, which is uh, intense and more on the left eye, is able to mask the curvature findings on the Pentacam and almost on the Placido disc 
And remember, the, the truth is in the epithelial maps. We've published on this extensively. We'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but for cornea cross-linking, uh, it's a very important point. So yes, we could do PRK here, taking that the patient will stop rubbing their eyes. Otherwise, one may consider also an adjunct flash cheek cell procedure, maybe uh, two minutes of uh, 30 millimeters per centimeter square with uh, riboflavin 0.1 saline diluted. But this is a discussion outside of the uh, scope of this talk with basic cross-linking principles. Uh, again, the key thing here is to be able to discover this, that this is a silent, progressive keratoconic case in a patient that's 51, and that we usually say, well, your keratoconus novel or story or tragedy is over. Now we talked about before about family, and this is the son of that particular lady that we saw, and we scanned him, we had him in the office, we offered a, a without charge a free scan, and you can see that uh, uh, both the pentacams and the epithelial maps uh, reveal active keratoconus in both eyes. Patient is 20-20 uncorrected, no visual complaints have been, has been evaluated several times up until his 21st birthday, uh, and has been found normal, but extensive and careful cornea imaging does flag active keratoconus. Active because the epithelium is blue uh, at the cone center. Uh, he's now wearing uh, RGP lenses and he's sleeping face down, part on his right eye, part on his left eye. Um, a good guess and confirmed by imaging. This family keeps giving and giving because this is the 23-year-old brother that was also present on the exam. Uh, scanned uh, with the uh, Bellin Ambrosio thickness comparison and everything here flags normal. Uh, the pentacam does not show any keratoconus at all. And the cornea thickness does so show symmetric change, but notice that there's a lot of colors in the thickness maps. And we said that normal is usually two colors. And also I can see a skewing, slight skewing inferior temporally for both eyes, towards the left for the right, towards the right for the left. Let's go and look what? You guessed it. Cornea thickness and epithelial maps with the anterior segment OCT. And here's our images clearly documenting active keratoconus in this patient as well. So this is the patient that we want to find. The silent, 2020, normal with other imaging keratoconic patient. Because if this changes, then we have to apply heavier treatments such as the Athens protocol, a, a keratoplasty technique. At this point, stop rubbing could be enough. Wearing a face mask, we gave you the data before on how to create a do-it-yourself face mask um, that a patient can sleep comfortably and stop rubbing their eyes because we feel it's mainly during their sleep and or applying a milder form of uh, cross-linking uh, epithelium on cross-linking here may have merit since we don't have clinical disease um, manifested it's just on the diagnostic level but i think this slide alone underlines the importance of epithelial uh, mapping and imaging in keratoconus and also the importance of mapping family members that have keratoconus. We have a mother with subtle keratoconus and we have both sons present with her with a two year difference showing uh, imaging uh, undisputed signs of keratoconus in both of their eyes. And I repeat, none of the uh, sons were wearing contact lenses. And again, this is a glimpse of our imaging room and our center here in Athens, Greece. You can see a milieu of uh, cornea diagnostic devices, epithelial maps, and total cornea thickness is key for me because in this particular example that I'm showing you here, the epithelial maps may look relatively normal, uh, the bottom two maps, left and right, but if you look at the thickness map, the top left thickness map of the right eye is not normal because the, thin, the thinnest part of the cornea is significantly decentered from the center of the cornea, inferior temporally, and you can kind of see a flavor of that in the left eye as well. So this is also 
in our eyes a genetically predisposed eye for keratoconus. It has not evolved into disease because the patient probably is not an eye rubber, but again, a slight underlying the value of cornea epithelial imaging. So a quick review uh, on this slide on our currently sensitive criteria on picking up keratoconus. Number one, topometric asymmetry indices in your pentacam, especially the IHD index of height decentration and the ISV index of surface variance. The pachymetry asymmetry, the maps showing the pachymetric distribution on each cornea with a sign fluke, if you only have pentacam to work with or, or other sign fluke uh, um, uh, devices, like the Galileo, etc., or better with OCT. Uh, the um, Pentacam uh, data on RT Max, uh, the Bell and Ambrosia data are helpful, but we saw that not as sensitive as the ones uh, that we talked about before. Epithelial profile is key, and of course, uh, we're waiting for uh, biomechanical objective measurements and accurate measurements with Brian technology that we hope we will soon have in our armamentarium of uh, cornea diagnostics. Now in my clinical practice, I use the above uh, along with family uh, imaging, as you see here as a last point being very important. And I think the slides we saw before kind of prove that point. This is just a slide showing our early reports um, on uh, treatment of keratoconus with the Athens protocol. And as I mentioned, we have reported over 1,000 eyes studied very carefully through the years with the epitome of all the um, uh, invited editorial by the Journal of Cornea, which was published in October 2023 on the Athens protocol in treatment of ectasias. Going into more specific science, uh, one of our studies looked at uh, how sacral rotation affects these very sensitive to sacral rotation treatments, the laser treatments. And we were able, by picking up the difference maps, and you're seeing an example here with the pentacam on the far right, and the pre-op curvature map, um, they're actually both sagittal curvature maps, uh, to uh, be corrected we were able to ascertain on the axis and the amount of uh, uh, cylinder corrected and do that comparison from pre to post and published that with uh, sacral rotation adjustment, we have a far more accurate treatment delivery as one would assume because uh, we know that when our patients lay under our laser, both of their eyes cycle rotate nasally. So the right eye cycle rotates towards the nose, so clockwise, the left eye, again, sacrotates towards the nose, but counterclockwise, and this has to be accounted for when you're performing treatments such as the one on the far left, which are very regular in nature, but very crucial in um, normalizing these corneas. In that same study, we uh, looked at how the anterior curvature improves compared to the posterior, and this is the only drawback in treating keratoconus with surface ablations. We have a drastic improvement of the anterior cornea curvature because that's where our treatment takes place, but we have very little change in the posterior cornea curvature, and remember, those eyes do not have a minus six overall posterior cornea power, as uh, does the Gullstrand eye. Um, and we have to take that to account, and this is a prelude of us using ray tracing to treat these eyes that I'll discuss in a little bit. Here are just a few uh, pearls on using higher fluency Excel and how it can help um, more than the standard Dresden protocol experience that we have found through the years, a slide to study and reflect. Here, um, again, our study uh, with um, hyperopic LASIK extra, the magenta curve is the eyes that were treated with standard LASIK, no in under the flap cross-linking. 
the dark blue eyes were the ones that received uh, adjunct under the flap cross thinking you can see how through time those hyperopic eyes that had LASIK extra appeared to be more stable in the hyperopic effect um, published at the JRS November 2012 also best paper session um, for our fellow our fellow and resident at the time Dr. Khan at the ACRS of the year prior We're going a little off track here and we're using cross-linking as a refractive procedure and we have published the initial literature with the KXL2 at the time, which is the predecessor for the Mosaic device approved outside the U.S. to also um, have a refractive effect on naive eyes that don't have keratoconus. You can see here the whole concept of um, performing a donut-shaped, very high-fluence intervention on the cornea without epithelial removal using um, uh, Vibex Extra, it's a higher concentration riboflavin, and Paracel, a epithelial abrasive, I would say, uh, riboflavin solution that's able to penetrate intact epithelium. And we're seeing the results on the bottom right, how these corneas became steeper, and proof of concept on the top uh, right, how the epithelial maps remained uh, stable and underlined the effect of this intervention. So now here, cross-linking with the mosaic, or at the time the KXL2 device, as a refractive procedure. Another application specific to the uh, KXL2 or mosaic device, an unfortunate uh, young colleague, this lady, uh, shared her time between London and Athens um, and uh, developed a contact lens related ulcer that we can see on the top middle with slight hypopion and we did design for her since she had to fly the next day besides switching her from uh, tobromycin corticosteroid drops that she was given I consider that a major mishap these patients do require uh, fortified antibiotic management because of the potential danger of this also developing into a tragedy. Um, so uh, along with fortified um, aminoglycosides and cephalosporins used every other hour, we also applied this focused and designed. You can see uh, on the bottom the uh, Myers from Placido Disc imaging that we used to take the surface deformation and place it in space from the vertex of the cornea and thus go on the KXL2 device it's now the uh, mosaic device uh, in, gluc in uh, glucose uh, industry terms and apply 20 milliwatts per centimeter square, a full 7.2 joules after we um, uh, soaked the cornea with Vibex Extra. And you can see the remarkable change in just one day uh, on the left, top uh, the day before the procedure or the day of the procedure, the nubular infiltrate and uh, under that how this has been flattened with the cross-linking treatment. Of course, we added for a few hours the fortified antibiotics. I don't believe the effect that we're seeing here is due to the antibiotics, it's due to this really focal treatment of cross-linking. So now we're seeing cornea cross-linking also as a very specific tool to treat cornea infection. And there has been literature on this, um, not though with a specific focused and topographically designed treatment. Some of the basic science work that we have done in our laboratory at the Laser Vision Laboratory Surgery Center. Here uh, we're doing a uh, uh, simulation of smile and um, placing after the removal of a lenticule from the cornea using a femtosecond laser, Vibex Extra and performing a through the cornea ex vivo cross-linking and showing that biomechanically the cross-linked uh, corneas uh, became much stronger thus counteracting the biomechanical uh, reduction in strength of the corneas with SMILE alone. This was published um, uh, in the literature and a very significant piece of the puzzle on how to use cross-thinking as a mode of customization of our uh, laser refractive surgery, including SMILE.
and um, we'll use the same concept of uh, a designed topographically designed treatment with the cake cell 2 or now the um, uh, mosaic device by Avidra in the past and Glaucos now you can see on the top uh, middle uh, the actual design for the device there is a, a red circle seven jewels to be delivered there's a blue um, middle curved rectangular shape that will deliver um, 10 joules of energy and there's a smaller green rectangular uh, uh, arced uh, shape that we will deliver 15 joules simultaneously tracked by the device on this cornea along with a subtle surface ablation um, and uh, the result uh, is remarkable we have very significant flattening we see the improvement of and I hope you remember from what we talked about before the IHD went from 241 to 46 keratoconus from stage 3 to 4 to 2 and ISV from 142 to 65 so a remarkable difference with very little tissue removal showing that adjunct uh, topography designed and customized CXL can add to the refractive effect of the Athens protocol also published in the literature um, and I thought it important for you to note also on this slide briefly Also an example here of treating myopia, a virgin uh, myopic eye, naive myopic eye treated with refractive CXL and uh, a four diopter flattening. The maximal result that we ever had with this technique, we usually get one or two doctors, but more um, clinical experimental work is performed, of course, outside the US because this uh, technology is not yet FDA approved um, and how it could um, be used to treat high amyotropias. We were the first team to report in 2013 through 2014 the potential refractive surgery benefits from this uh, technology and technique uh, alike. And we will close with uh, our work in using ray tracing, our, a new kit on the block on customization of uh, eczema laser treatments to the cornea to treat keratoconus. And obviously the major advantage here is that this technology views the cornea not only, views the whole eye as an optical system and thus views keratoconic eyes as eyes with tilted corneas. And we'll talk a little bit about this in the, the next slides. A presentation uh, uh, from um, uh, 2020 at the ESCRS that uh, evolved into uh, the first publication of ray tracing Athens protocol at the Journal of Cornea in 2021. And uh, this is one of the cases that we actually the case we reported as an example in our paper in the Journal of Cornea. On the top images, uh, we're seeing um, the same eye designed to be treated with topo guided for the Athens protocol, um, and uh, the other eye also. And on the bottom, the same eye is designed to be treated with ray tracing. And note the difference that the, the ray tracing treatment um, uh, profiles with refraction being set to zero treat mainly the superior hyperopic arc and less the peak of the cone. They, they want to flatten the cone less. Why? Because they treat more of the tilt that the cornea has developed with the ectasia compared to the lenticular system as an optical system that it should be in parallel with. So this is the pearl and I know it's very complicated for the context of this uh, presentation but you can read our publication in the Journal of Cornea uh, we think that this is pivotal in um, tissue preservation and um, approaching emetropia when uh, employing the Athens protocol in uh, progressive keratoconus and uh, an integral part of our research work in our center here in Athens, Greece. And I'll show you a few more slides and wrap up. So we're coming to the um, editorial, uh, October 2023, for the Journal of Cornea. Very honored to have been asked by the journal, uh, the uh, absolute top pedigree in uh, cornea work, 
to summarize our experience and the experience of all other clinicians that have used the Athens Protocol or slightly a modification of it. Um, and uh, here we are um, uh, showing the key principles that we discussed uh, together in this talk on the top uh, right picture, the basic concept of uh, the ablation, which is not a normal myopic PRK. It's a very regular ablation that is used in therapeutic terms. In the middle, right after that, the drastic improvement in cornea, uh, total cornea curvature that reflects improvement in visual function besides stabilization of uh, their keratoconus. On the bottom, a very important pearl with the Athens Protocol eyes that it may be not viewed well in this image, but we're trying to pick the cross-linking line in these eyes, and it's very broad, almost nine millimeters, and very deep. Um, and here we're also seeing the epithelial remodeling that we talked about before, uh, key to assessing the success of cross-linking and the fact that the patient is not rubbing their eyes. The work of 20 years within one paper. So I invite you to read this. We've uh, um, made this a open access paper. Uh, clock in your uh, uh, web searcher to the Journal of Cornea, download and read this paper from October in 2023 pretty much holds all this talk in summary. So what we discussed here in the summary, uh, CXL has proven and has become the standard of care throughout the world in treatment of keratoconus and uh, post-refractive uh, surgery ectasia. We know that CXL alone achieves a significant stabilization and maybe a one to three diopter normalization. I don't want to say flattening because we saw and we learned in, in keratoconus, it's not just flattening the cone that's important, it's also important to raise or steepen the area that flattens in keratoconus, sinks if you may in quotations, along with the protrusion of the cone area. So normalization of the cornea. We have worked for all these years in patients that are basically contact lens intolerant and combining a uh, therapeutic partial and refraction surface ablation with CXL um, accelerator, higher fluence CXL, uh, and showed that the Athens protocol may be a superior procedure than all. And of course, this uh, with the caution that clinicians be, should be aware of overcorrecting, potential delayed healing and or scarring, and um, uh, the significance of the effective ablation plan delivery when choosing which laser and the importance of sacral rotation and active tracking um, and uh, the current protocols that we use in our practice. It has been really a pleasure to speak of uh, the work uh, that has defined at least uh, myself uh, as a clinician and as an academician over the last 20 years. I've published over 100 papers with my team with the um, uh, premier one being the one that I mentioned in this previous slide in Journal of Cornea. I hope you found this uh, uh, material interesting and I hope it creates a seed for you to uh, learn more about cross-linking and more about cornea imaging and uh, be able to benefit our patients across the globe uh, uh, with a higher level of expertise, caution, and care. Thanks so much. This is um, John Kanlopoulos uh, signing out.